Yep, it happened in that office right there. Probably, I'm guessing 1987, maybe 88, a conversation with John Benedetto that became one of the bedrock beacons, to mix metaphors, of my entire ministerial life. I met John Benedetto. I was fresh out of seminary, came from Andrews University, and I went to the New York Center. How many of you are old enough to remember the New York Center? Can I see your hand? A few of you? The church used to have an evangelistic center on 46th Street between 7th and 8th Avenue. And I lived there on the 6th floor. When I looked out my bedroom window, it was looking at the back door of the uh, musical, The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. <laughs> at that time, Times Square was a little rasty. I would be accosted by prostitutes if I wore a suit, by middle-aged men if I wore casual clothes, and was usually offered drugs on the walk from the subway to the front door of the New York Center. So what a perfect place for an evangelistic center. We, we started a Bible study and went out on the street and handed out little flyers inviting people to come to our Bible study. And one of the guys who showed up was John Benedetto. John, you know, he came just a few weeks and then said he would be interested in personal studies. Maybe, and I'm thinking, I am fresh out of seminary. I am so full of all the knowledge that I've gained, you know, the books I've read, the theology I've mastered, and this is going to be my first convert. I'm going to give him studies. He's going to get baptized and the angels in heaven are going to be singing. Problem was, we didn't get much Bible study done. John would come to the center, and we would sit down to study, and I would have my outline all prepared. You know, I learned how to do that as a theology student. We might cover one or two texts. John, it turned out he actually knew the Bible fairly well. He had studied with the Catholics and the Baptists and the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. But John's life hurt. He'd grown up in a church in the Bronx. His dad had been the caretaker and was profoundly abusive. And so for John, the face of God looked a whole lot like an angry, scary dad. His life was a series of failures and heartbreaks. At the time I knew him, he was suffering from some skin problems. He smelled bad because of his difficulty. He was estranged from his son and his daughter, and life was difficult with his wife. And then while we were studying, his cat died. And if this was not a real person, you, know, you, you kind of laugh. You know, the cat died. It, it's a laugh line. Except when all you've got in the world that's working right is a cat and you lose even that. So we kept studying. Huh. I call it Bible studies. John would talk about his life. And then I'd need to go and pray for an hour afterwards to try to recover myself. The New York Center closed. I went to Babylon to become a pastor. Um, and the saints in Babylon, some of the saints in Babylon are here. They taught me how to be a pastor, especially Sam Walker, Ms. Roloff, and Mrs. Crawford. Before I went to Babylon, I knew how to be a pastor because I had studied the books. I could tell you everything that was in the books. These people knew God, and they showed me how to do church. Had a wonderful time, and after four years there, conference asked me to come to this church to help with the transition from German to English, and so to begin with, we started a Bible study in the basement on Sabbath afternoons. I'd preach out in Babylon, and then come in here, and we'd do this Bible study, and two or three weeks in, who shows up? John Benedetto. I have no idea how he knew that I was here, but he shows up. 
and his life was not any better. And he would come to Bible studies. And he was a smart guy, but he really had very little interest in all the various religious theories. I became full-time here. John became a member of the congregation. And over the years, we would talk God, we would talk theology. And as far as I could tell, over the years that I knew him, his, his words about God never changed. I remembered when I first met him in Times Square, and I asked him about believing in God, and he said, well, he knew a lot of smart people did. I'm going, do, do you believe? Well, he didn't know whether he believed or not. He knew a lot of smart people did. He had read books. But here he was in the congregation with his body odor, with the dandruff that flaked and fell, with his dirty clothes. Not always dirty, but dumpy. He was one of us. And at that time, he was quite a standout because most of the people here were young in Manhattan to make it. I mean, like the people you see here, beautiful people. And here's John, you know, kind of a real sore thumb sticking out. But he was part of us. So let's leave John for a minute and let's go to the Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you have the Sermon on the Mount constitution of the kingdom of heaven. If you want to know what it means to be a Christian, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's what it looks like to be a Christian. And it is a grand and glorious and impossible ideal. But if you're not aiming at it, you're probably not a Christian. I mean, if you read the Sermon on the Mount and take it seriously... Every word you speak will be true and beautiful. According to Jesus, there is no room for ugly words and for untruth. According to Jesus, relationships are never broken. According to Jesus, as we sang in the... Or maybe we're singing that song later. <laughs> According to Jesus, if it comes down to them or us, we transform that into us for them. If I can prove you're my enemy, that is simply the measure of my obligation to bless you. This is hard stuff. It is an incredibly exalted ideal. Now, if you read this when you're in your 20s and you are really devout, this can be pretty heady stuff. You get with your buddies. This is what we do at seminary. We're there. We want to save the world for God. And we read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's real Christianity. You know, we want to do real church. And we imagine a church populated by people who have embraced the ethic of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. We are living it together. A church that doesn't have the riffraff in it. No, no mediocre Christians. We imagine this pure church just marching on to the kingdom. And if the Gospel of Matthew ended with Matthew 7, it would be a terrible book. And it would be logically used for a whole lot of spiritual abuse. Because I could identify a bunch of you who didn't quite measure up to my interpretation of those chapters. But the Gospel of Matthew does not end with chapter 7. He goes on to chapter 8. So again, to set the context, you come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has painted this 
glorious, exalted ethic so high that our enemies are the people we pray for, that we are indiscriminately generous, as generous as God in heaven who sends his son on the unjust and his reign on everyone. And Jesus then tells us the two stories, the guys who build their house on the rock or the sand, you know, and the sand house goes flat. And he says, so do what I told you. The end. Wow. This is a challenging ethic. Are you going to do it? And then you come to Matthew 8. Imagine it as a movie, if you would. Matthew chapter 8 opens. Jesus is teaching. There's crowds of people out there. Hearing, I suppose, the words that we heard in the Sermon on the Mount. This exalted call to holiness and goodness and purity and love. Also, we've already been alerted by Matthew 4 that Jesus is busy healing. Half the world wants to be there because who wouldn't want to be healed? And the camera pulls back and you see this sea of people. And then off over there, off over there, there's a, there's a handful of people. You can see ragged clothes. They're not in very good shape. And one of them peels off from there and begins heading toward the crowd. And as he comes toward the crowd, you can hear in the distance that he's saying something. And you listen closely and you hear, unclean, unclean, unclean. And the crowd, as he approaches, begins to part. That man is a leper. He's not allowed to come into crowds. He is required to shout unclean so people can stay away. But going into a crowd, shouting this is completely not acceptable. It could get you killed. And as you see him starting into the crowd and the crowd splitting, you can see people picking up rocks, getting ready to take care of this person. Now let me step back for a minute. Let's paint a picture of who this person is. In that world... A leper, and scholars argue about the exact nature of what disease it was. doesn't matter. It was ugly. It was nasty. It's a problem. A leper, everybody knew, was a leper because God cursed them. Leprosy was proof that you were cursed by God. If you had leprosy, God had cursed you. Plain and simple. People didn't get leprosy unless God cursed them. And why would God curse you? <laughs> Come on, what, what, what did you do? Or maybe it was your parents. Somebody really screwed up, didn't they? I mean, you and I look at somebody with a sickness like that, and we would offer a biological explanation, and we, we would offer comfort, solace, understanding. But that's because we read the disease differently. A leper was a leper because God had cursed them. And then there were rules about not coming into crowds. So when people were picking up stones, they were being reasonable. There were rabbis who prided themselves on throwing stones at lepers to make sure that the lepers stayed far enough away that the rabbi never got contaminated. The leper is making his way through the crowd. No stones have been thrown yet. The only reason is because of the presence of Jesus. People are waiting for Jesus to frown. If Jesus would just give the crowd one frown toward that man, there's a whole lot of righteous people who would happily carry out Jesus' wish for this person to go away. Their rocks would be effective. Finally, this man 
who we know is cursed by God, is on the ground in front of Jesus. This man was born in the Jewish community. But his community had told him, God hates you and you're dangerous. He comes and he throws himself at the feet of Jesus and does not ask to be healed. Now, if you go through the Gospels, there are other people who get healed without asking. It does happen. But we usually think of people going, Lord, help me. Have mercy. He doesn't do that. He makes a statement. Lord, if you are willing... You could make me well. So it is a question. Are you willing? Are you willing to help me? God is mad at me. And I think you work with God. So you must be mad at me too, right? As you're watching this movie, you hear the man's words. If you are willing... You could heal me. And then the camera lingers and Jesus doesn't move. And we watching, we think, well, is Jesus trying to figure out whether whether he will do it? And because we're Christians, we're going, oh, no, Jesus will do this. We're sure he'll do this. But watching the movie, if we don't know the story, we hear those words. If you are willing, you could heal me. And then we, we feel this pause and we wonder, will Jesus heal Somebody who has already been cursed by God? And what does Jesus do? Do you know the story? Before Jesus heals him, while he is still a leper, bearing all of the signs of the curse of God, Jesus touches him. And I like to think Jesus grabs him. I imagine Jesus grabbing his shoulders. Or maybe even grabbing his head and burying his fingers in the man's hair. He's untouchable. He's unacceptable. And he is now touched and accepted. As a leper. And then Jesus heals him. We are the community of Jesus. We are called to do what Jesus does. Do we embrace those who are cursed by God? according to the culture around us. We today dismiss this notion that God had cursed that leper because we're smart. But are we today willing to embrace those that our culture calls cursed? Yes, we are because we're Christians. We will do this thing. Back to John Benedetto. In his years here, life continued to be difficult. Showed up at church one Sabbath, splints on both arms. This was back in the days when you used a token to get on the subway. He was a token clerk. And part of his job was, at different times in the shift, he would go out and empty the turnstiles, bring the tokens back into the token booth. And so one time when he was doing that, some people jumped him, threw him down the stairs. And he banged both arms up and, you know, the arms healed up okay. But what does it do to your soul when human beings throw you down the stairs? Sometime later, he showed up at church with evidence of burns on his body. Not severe, but there were a lot of them. 
He had hollered at somebody who had jumped the turnstile. They had come back with friends, poured gasoline on his booth, and lit it. He escaped. He was not severely injured, not bodily. But what does it do to your soul when a human being looks at you and tries to burn you alive? Where is God? Fortunately, for John Benedetto, God was not yet dead. One Sabbath, I invited people who were interested in getting baptized to come and talk to me after church. And the only person who responded was, John Benedetto, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Because, remember, his statement of faith was uh, he knew a lot of smart people believed in God. <laughs> that was as close as he ever got to faith. So, we got together on Wednesday in this office. John, this is so exciting. You want to get baptized? Tell me about how it is with you and God. Do you believe in God now, John? He repeated exactly what I'd heard for 10 years. Well... I know a lot of smart people do. This was not going well. I asked him if he believed Jesus had forgiven his sins. He said, it'd be nice to think so. Good to, John. So, you know, I did what preachers do. I took the Bible. I put it in his hands. I had him open the Bible to 1 John 1, 9. We read through the text, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John, I ask him, have you confessed your sins? And inwardly, I'm laughing. Of course he has. He's confessed them to me a hundred times. John, have you confessed your sins? Yeah. Does it say here in this text that if you confess your sins, God will forgive you? Yes, it says that. So, John, has God forgiven you your sins? It would be nice to think so. Can we receive into full membership in the Seventh-day Adventist Church through baptism a person who is aware that some smart people believe in God and it would be nice if Jesus could forgive sins? Is that good enough for you? Yes, it's good enough for you because you're Christians and you follow Jesus Christ. So however many years ago it was, Advent Hope set a pattern. When I asked John, so John, you don't really believe in God. You don't really believe in forgiveness. Why do you want to be baptized? He started in again about his son was AWOL from the Navy and his daughter had defrauded him out of $25,000 and he was not getting along with his wife and his dog was not well, and he was getting beat up at work, and, and it was a long story, and I, I cut him off. John, John, yeah, I know. Why, why do you want to be baptized? Because this is the first place where I have been safe. His testimony and God's call, may we carry it on.